I++ is probably the first increment that we make when we embark on our software journey. We assume it's guaranteed, it's atomic, and it will lead to one if it was zero before no matter what. And there comes a time when our assumptions are challenged and apparently that simple operation is not atomic. And that is when we talk about concurrency. Ladies and gentlemen, you are watching 100GB and welcome to 10th episode which is about concurrency and best practices. Uh, in case you don't know, so uh, the series is all about this great book called Clean Code by Robert C. Martin. And we are kind of going chapter by chapter, not really. Uh, we skipped a few chapters <laughs> and I add some opinionated information on top of the stuff that is already there in the book. Let's get to the first topic. Why is concurrency important or why do we even study it? Okay, L let's try to like quickly refresh fresh our concepts. Let's try to revisit the I++ uh, example. Okay, so this is a very simple class. Uh, it has an instance variable i. In the main method, it has a thread that keeps on incrementing i for uh, like a hundred thousand or one million times. Then uh, another thread that does the same for another million times. I start both the threads and then wait for both the threads to uh, finish. Okay, so this Take a pause, what do you think what the output will be? Well, 2 million, of course. But interestingly, the output is always different every single time and it's always less than 2 million. Well, on my machine, it also gave uh, 1,009,000 once. So you see the factor, it can actually reduce to half as well. Strange, what's happening? All right, let's try a simpler, uh, let's try to demystify a simpler case where we have this instance variable and there's a simple method, increment uh, and log. It increments the uh, this i and this then just logs it. So what is this? What are you seeing right now? This is the generated bytecode for uh, this particular uh, method. So bytecode can be thought of as uh, the actual instructions that the uh, compiler, not the compiler, but maybe the JVM sees and executes. I'm not 100% sure that I need to refresh my concepts but more or less you can regard it as uh, as the machine code. And there are a lot of things happening here, but the most interesting is this put field and get field. So let's say this, this particular method is being called from multiple th threads at the same time. And let's say both the threads come to this, uh, uh, this particular instruction, which reads the field, which is zero initially, and both go from here and uh, if both come here at the same time and then regardless of which one uh, does this job first, the end result would be the same, uh, which will be one and not two because both will read the this particular field as zero. And by the time they uh, come here, both will set it set it as one. And th that is that is the the underlying reason why we see different results in our previous case. OK. The remedy, we can discuss about how to how to make this code correct. Well, obviously, we need to use the synchronize uh, keyword, which will make sure that the, the thread waits for the other thread, which is already executing this code. But the interesting part is, should you synchronize uh, over, over this statement or should you synchronize over uh, this for loop in both of these cases? Well, that is for you to figure it out. <laughs> Let me know in the comment section which one to use and why. All right, let's quickly talk about some myths about concurrency. The first one is that concurrency always improves performance well, which is not true at all. A few years back, I, a thought came to my mind that why is concurrency even a thing? Because a processor can anyway do one thing at a time. And back in the days, we just had single processor devices. For a single processor machine, why is concurrency even a thing? Well, the answer was pretty simple, that the processor is not busy all the time. Think about modern server where you are writing something to the database and the processor is actually waiting for the network I.O. most of the time and sitting idle. And that is where the concurrency uh, comes into the picture. But in the same case, if you have a job that is CPU bound and the concurrency won't actually help, a CPU bound job is effectively code that doesn't involve any I.O. Uh, that is like the mathematical computation, image or video processing, uh, encryption and stuff like that. So if you have a CPU bound job, concurrency won't help. The other myth is that the design does not change when writing concurrent programs. Oh, oh well, again, this is like uh, pretty wrong. 
because concurrent program can be significantly different from or should be significantly different from the single threaded counterpart. You need to take encapsulation at heart and uh, make sure you don't expose unnecessary variables outside. You have to be very strict. You need to make sure that the threading constructs are actually inside just one class and that the class is like hidden uh, from the entire code base altogether. Or at least the threading part of it is hidden from the uh, other code. So there are a few current bits about concurrency as well. The first one is that concurrency incurs some overhead, which is absolutely correct. And the fun fact is a single thread in Java takes around 2 MB in the RAM. Think about your Android phone. You have what 4 GBs of RAM these days, which is a baseline and hundreds of processes are running on your phone. An application is effectively one process. That process can have like hundreds of threads, not really, but it can potentially create many threads. And every thread takes around 2 MB uh, of RAM and just do the calculation. And a lot of people come to you know, I'm running so many apps and the phone is uh, being uh, slowed down. There you go, the reason. This is just one thread to MB. Uh, the, the other uh, correct bit is that the concurrency bugs are hard because they, they, they really are. So uh, I'm pretty sure all the people who have ever uh, debugged a concurrency bug, they realize they, it is very hard. And the problem is that it, it's hard to reproduce in the sense you will always get some intermittent result and it becomes like hard. All right, let's talk about some concurrency uh, defense principles. The first one is the single responsibility principle that comes everywhere. <laughs> okay, so you should keep your concurrency related code separate from the other code, uh, as I just mentioned. Let's take a quick example here. Let's say I'm writing this Android app where I have an image loader. Uh, this maintains an internal LRU cache for the images that have been loaded. Then it has a very simple method to load the image, which takes in the URL and takes in the image view. Image view is effectively the view where this image will be shown after it has been loaded. When I say loaded, I mean loaded from the network. And it creates a lot of threads. Uh, maybe it uses some thread pool. The best part about this image loader is that it actually doesn't leak any of the threading information outside of this class. So in some sense, it can be thought of as single responsibility, where the entire threading responsibility is built inside this class. But in reality, there still might be one thing that I should do. I should probably have it like add UA thread because, or I can have some defense in the load image method because this method could potentially be called by multiple threads itself uh, by the calling users. So at least this method is being called from just one thread so that I don't need to take care about any synchronization. But the other option is that I just don't use that and synchronize everything inside of it so that it's uh, it, it can be called from multiple threads. And that's it. The second principle is limit the scope of the data. Um, as I mentioned before, you should take data encapsulation to heart, like severely limit the excess of any data that can be shared. Variables should be private. Uh, if not private, then some other class running in a different thread can potentially access it and screw the state. And just for all the best practices of the classes that we discussed in the previous episode. The third principle is use copies of data. So whenever returning the data from a function, or accepting new data in the function, use copies. Uh, this will make sure that the moment you receive the object, your function is the sole owner of it. And it cannot be corrupted by some other thread which is still playing around with that object. Uh, well, this is a very real problem uh, which happens quite often. Let's take a look at the code. All right, so you have this uh, method that does some stuff. It takes in the AI tools list and just assume this code is not there. And there's some other function uh, that has a thread and in the thread, it has a list of cool AI tools. Uh, it runs a thread which keeps on removing the last element from this cool AI tools. And th then it actually calls this method as well. Like before calling this method, it just starts this thread. Now what will happen is that in your do stuff method, so let's say it's a, it's a long method it shouldn't be ideally so ai tools.get and you're needing the ai tools at multiple places in this method while this thread is running it will be disastrous over here you will get let's say five elements over here you might get just three elements now just think about this uh, this function let's say this is this method is uh, in a library which you're writing now you assume that this particular uh, list can never change and you are totally fine if you get it here and then you get it 
there you will get the same values but magic magically you know, the value is changing which means that this this code will fail somewhere it will probably throw some kind of null pointer exception somewhere and the users will be mad at you because you didn't handle it so you should use copies everywhere the best thing to do here is just create a uh, like a deep copy of this and and use that copy or there there are some other methods uh, some there are some other ways where you can use an immutable list so that you make sure that if you uh, get the list over here it cannot be modified even with some other thread that is already working in the calling method all right fourth principle threads should be as independent as possible oh, now what do we mean by that threads should ideally be as separate as possible to avoid any concurrency problem they should have their own data uh, their own code paths and manipulate just that like in a world like this, we actually don't need any synchronization at all. Let's take a hypothetical example. Microservices on a single machine is a very good example. Uh, just beware, like those are not threads, but processes. We can take an example, uh, again, hypothetical, let's say we have Uber uh, and Uber can have rider service, driver service and payment service on a single machine running as different processes. And you get this benefit for free. Uh, you actually don't need any synchronization or I should say you don't need to intersynchronize anything manually. You can rely on the database transactions and just call it a day. All right, fifth principle, uh, thread safe collections. Java provides some beautiful classes to deal with concurrency. A few examples are like concurrent hash map, priority blocking queue. So priority blocking queue in particular is like partially helpful for producer consumer problems uh, where it doesn't block the producers because it doesn't have this capacity thing but it does block the uh, consumers if goes to zero and make yourself familiar with the java.util.concurrent package a lot of good utilities uh, there as well you should also use the various locking mechanisms at your disposal uh, to name a few you have re re-entrant lock semaphore uh, and one interesting one is countdown latch I personally use it quite often, mostly like an integration test. So quite a few times you have to wait for an event or multiple events to happen in a test, usually in a different thread. And countdown latch is just uh, very nice. You, you don't need to, you don't have to actually pull for that event to happen. It saves you from that. All right, the sixth principle, make your threaded code pluggable. Now, this is actually a very good point. We can take the single responsibility princ uh, principle example again. Let's say uh, if I were to actually write this code, I would insert a constructor that takes in a thread pool and I'll store this uh, internally and use this instead of manually creating threads. Now, the nice part about this is that in my tests uh, or in my staging environment, I can actually tweak the configuration i can have multiple threads or just have single thread in testing sometimes like for unit tests i would want that i just have one thread things are simple i can do that and actually this is a really good practice this is something which is actually followed as well uh, seventh principle you should know your execution model well yeah so another thing that the book recommends is that you should know a few basic concurrency problems and understand their solutions those are pretty important so problems like producer consumer reader writers and dining philosophers very classic uh, problems that we as software engineers go through during our course well i don't want to dive deeper into them as i assume that you would have already gone gone through them during the course or maybe we can cover it in some other video some other time all right the last part testing your threaded code so the first part here is that you should run uh, you should run with more threads than the processors that are available real issues happen when system switches uh, between tasks so if the number of threads are less than processors then there won't be any task switch and a task will potentially always lead to direct completion let's try to visualize what i'm trying to say here so let's say you have three uh, processors and you have two threads each thread is running a task Right, task one and task two. Now what will happen is this that these tasks won't actually incur any kind of uh, interruption among themselves. They'll just lead to completion. So to make things more interesting or to make sure that uh, your application takes a, takes a more general view uh, of things, you should do it like this. So let's say if there was just two processors you should try to use three or more threads so that when you are running 
three tasks since there are only two processes which means only two threads can actually run at a time at least one task will have to wait uh, so that would have, uh, actually mean that uh, if your code survives this your code is actually much better so the, the high level idea is that your code should be able to handle um, uh, like a more critical path which would effectively mean that your code is more robust. Then the other point here, uh, over here is that you should run on different platforms. The way concurrency is handled on Mac OS might be different from the way it is handled in Windows, uh, Windows XP, maybe Android phone. So the more platforms you try, the more confidence you build in your concurrency code. All right, let's come to the last section, which is uh, instrumenting your threading code. Well, the book mentions a hand coded way of doing it, which is maybe not mentioning in this video. Let's jump to the automated way of doing it, which is pretty awesome. All right, so let's take an example of the code. Let's say we have this code at hand, which is a stuff method, which initializes a variable to zero, increments it and just prints it out, nothing fancy here. So in order to instrument this code in, let's say in uh, in our testing, we can introduce this class or interface. Uh, yeah, it's a class. It, yeah, it can be in, it can be an interface and we can have different implementations of this uh, interface. It has a jiggle method. It can either do nothing, either sleep or yield. Else. So we can improve our method by using this jiggle method in between our statements. So uh, as of now, I'm using this jiggle after every code statement that I have. Now what I can do is in my in my tests, I can use an implementation of the thread jiggle that maybe sleeps and which will make sure that my threading code is actually very robust because if the code still works in an expected way even after this jiggling the code the code is pretty good there's another thing to note here that i probably need to use a variant of this jiggler which does nothing for the actual production code because otherwise uh, it'll, it'll be it'll take a performance set in the sense i will end up doing unnecessary sleeping in the production code which is actually not required so yeah um and with that we have reached the end of this video. So I'd like to mention that I've skipped a few important concepts like primarily deadlock. As far as the book is concerned, it just mentions like a sentence about it. And we usually go through it in a, in a really detailed manner in our courses. I can think of creating maybe a separate video on the topic itself and the real life strategies that we use to address it. Uh, but yeah, it, it didn't make the cut for this video. And that's all folks. Uh, we are very close towards the end of this series. This was the second last episode and I just have one episode to go where we'll talk about systems and uh, how how the design or how how the architecture of the app evolves over time and mostly in terms of code. So don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I will see you in the last episode. Well, obviously not, not last video on the channel though. All right, okay, bye-bye.